pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Laws of 1975. This meeting notice was sent to the Asbury Park Press on March 5th, 2018 and April 26, 2018, and has been duly advertised in the Asbury Park Press. Issue on March 7th, 2018 and April 28th, 2018. All municipal clerks of the townships and boroughs within the regional high school district have been duly notified and the requirements of posting of notices have been met on March 5th, 2018 and April 26, 2018. Mr. Boyce, are you prepared to take the roll call? <laughs> Here. 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 All right, if everybody would please stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, moving on. Um, there are no minutes to approve. Were there any communications received in the board offices over the last week that we need to know about? No, All right, then I'm going to head um, hand it over to Mr. Sampson for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Messinger. So uh, this evening is the formal budget uh, presentation from Mr. Boyce and. Uh, you know, this is, I believe, Mr. Boyce's 11th budget here at the Freehold Regional High School District. And I think that um, over the years, one of the things that he uh, does very, very well is to take uh, some very complex processes and break them down in, in a way that's very manageable for uh, the board to digest, the public to digest, and frankly, myself to digest. So uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Boyce. Uh, under the, the state's 
coding model. Actually, it's a national coding model. Um, also included in here are support services. So there are student support services and there are um, program services. Student support services are those things that are necessary to, to put our students in the right place, in the right condition, to accept direct instruction. For, for things like guidance, uh, child study, the nurse's office. Program supports are the curriculum writing, the staff development that go into the improvement of the program. So all of that 70%, the larger portion of that pie, directly contributes to the quality of education. The remaining 30%, facilities, transportation, administration, that's essentially the infrastructure necessary to bring students to school to have a safe, uh, comfortable environment for them to learn and for the administrative responsibilities that all school districts have. Um, and then there's also a small um, slice of that that's capital. So overall, this year's budget has about a 2% increase in spending. Now, schools are uh, personnel intensive. So better than 70% of the total spend is, is people. Uh, that's salaries and, salaries and wages and benefits. Um, about the, the increase of 2% is just under $4 million. And of that $4 million, 70% of that number is for, for those people in those two categories. Salary and wage categories increased by uh, 1%, and then benefits picks up the rest. The remaining areas are uh, really in two different spots. Tuition, we send uh, some students where we cannot meet their needs here in the district to uh, placement in private schools for the handicap. Uh, so that's also seeing some increase, and also in the area of transportation, which has seen increases in recent years, um, increases that are becoming increasingly difficult to accommodate. Um, <coughs> capital project, there is one capital project represented in this budget. There's a handout and, and on, on, on the web with this video that should also be uh, the same handout that gives a lot of the detailed information um, that's represented in this overall pie chart. And one of the items that's separated out in there um, is a $1 million project for the Manalapan High School Auditorium. So, uh, <coughs> Let me just make a comment about the referendum. About a month ago, we had a, uh, a conversation here in this room about an upcoming ref referendum. It's October 2nd, uh, and it's a very important part of our overall coordination <coughs> of effort uh, to, to consider the programs that we need to provide and, and the funding that's available to us. So that referendum is in four main buckets. Security, it's modernized instructional spaces, um, athletic facilities, and then also there are some infrastructure items, roofs, paving, that type of thing. That information is available on the website. That is linked to this budget because there is limited ability for school districts, this school district, most school districts, to provide for large-scale capital improvements within an annual operating budget. So the lay of the land has changed and I'll touch on that when we get to the revenue side. Um, the $1 million for the Manalapan Auditorium is something that was originally considered in the referendum, but we had some parameters that we needed to hit there uh, with our expiring debt in um, with the existing bond issue. We wanted to coordinate our efforts, um, and we, we set the parameters of two-thirds, one-third, as, as you know, two-thirds reinvestments, in the district and the remaining third to allow um, the tax reduction associated with that debt expiring. Um, but there were a number of things that we were not able to fit into that referendum and still meet those parameters. And one of them was Manalapan High School Auditorium. It made sense to remove that and fund it separately because it's, a, it's, a, it's an area that's where Manalapan is different than the other schools. The majority of that money is associated with HVAC, air conditioning, and food electric, which now does not have. Then there's also um, renovations, modest renovations to the flooring and um, seating as well. But that's the only capital project that's included in this budget. So that's a, that's a high level snapshot. Like I said, the handout supplements that with more detailed information. The fair question that I get from members of the community um, is that, you know, that that's good information, but how do we know that a district is spending uh, the right amount of money? <coughs> and there, is, uh, there are data points out there 
of those I set as an anchor, some red line uh, that goes across the graph at 100%, uh, just as a point of reference to see where we land in relation to that. So of the 31 districts, nine of them are of the same district factor group. That is the socioeconomic status of the community. So the states organize groups, districts by socioeconomic. So they are, in essence, our sibling districts. Same type of community, same type of expectations, same type of resources uh, to support education. That's represented by the, the first column. I'm sorry, by the, the gray column, the middle column there. Um, and then of those 31, five are in Monmouth County. So there are five high school districts in Monmouth County only. And, and the average of those uh, is also in so what you can see is we fare very well in the spending metrics. Uh, I usually talk about this in very limited capacity because so many have the story. But the objective of public education is not to spend as little as possible. It's to, it's to provide the appropriate education as efficiently as possible. So this information in and of itself isn't the whole story you would need to see performance metrics in order to really understand return on investment. And I think that's where this district really shines. Because we have the economy of scale, because we have uh, the, the kind of um, resources at a, at a larger community, the eight municipalities that, that we cover, that we can, put, we can offer programs and, and services that other districts can, certainly other high school districts cannot. So, um, this is independent information. Uh, it's audited um, and it's compiled by the state. This is the most recent information that they had available up there. So that's a, an overview of the appropriations and where the money is spent. The resources necessary to provide that breaks down like this. And again, the handout has uh, more, more detailed information. But as you can see, you know, the lion's share of our support comes from the property tax. So 26% of it from state aid. So if you were to look at school districts across the states uh, at this type of breakdown, where we have 26%, that number is moving all over the place on the district by district basis. And the reason is that state aid is distributed primarily based on wealth indicators. So uh, a community will receive state aid based on its population and its needs, but also based on what's remaining after the community's ability to pay is taken into consideration. So you'll see districts that receive very little, one or two percent, you'll see districts that receive 90 plus percent. So there's a variable there. Um, property taxes are the backfill as the state looks at it according to the funding formula. And our property tax levy, um, this represents a 2% increase in our property tax levy. So property taxes for the last eight years have been under a cap system. That cap system says, okay, you can increase your total levy um, by no more than 2%, although there are some exceptions that would allow you to go beyond that, increase enrollment, healthcare costs, and that sort of those together would be the most uh, tax study increase that you could create. Um, we have eligibility to go beyond the 2% um, for healthcare costs in excess of certain thresholds uh, to about 2.5%. We're taking the option to bank that cap, and here's how that works. So um, there's a 2% cap, but the state has said that if you want to levy less than that, you can take the difference and bank it and consider using it in each of the two subsequent years. Now over the eight years that this cap system has been in place, this district has gone to 2%, gone to less than 2%, and it's gone to zero. Uh, it's accessed bank cap and gone over 2%. It's allowed bank cap to lapse beyond the 2%. The decisions were made and are to continue to be made according to what the conditions of the community are at that point in time. Uh, the program and also the overall economic conditions. So the, the 
decision this year is to bank the availability of another $670,000 of property taxes and uh, to be considered for use in uh, the future, either of the two subsequent budgets. State aid. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over state aid. Um, and with a change in administration, this is very often the time that you can see any significant moves one way or the other. Um, those discussions will um, conclude, and that will be part of Governor Murphy's final budget. The initial budget offered by Governor Murphy has us at flat state funds. We've been flat for a number of years. Um, I think that we are vulnerable, and I think it's something that Mr. Sampson and I are um, highly aware of and keeping a very close eye on that. Uh, but for the budget as it stands right now, it includes staff, flat, state aid, um, and more to be determined as the state continues through its process. So the property tax, the remaining property tax, the 2% increase, here's the unique thing about a regional is that unlike school districts that represent just one municipality, it's fairly predictable as the levy increases you can expect tax rates to move accordingly. With a regional district, there are eight communities, and the way that's calculated is not only related to what's happening in your own community, but what's also happening in other the other seven communities and where you stand in relation result of it is that it's very abrupt. There's ups, there's downs, year over year, somewhat unpredictable on how the total tax levy is allocated to the, the eight towns. Let me show you what that looks like. Here's over the last four years. Those are percentage increases and decreases by town. So you can see that um, it's difficult to Predict what the impact would be in any one given year when the, the movements of change in percentage share allocation um, is so volatile. Um, the, what's considered, and, and the state dictates, here's, here's how you carve up the tax cut. Uh, and they look at uh, primarily two things um, property wealth and school aged kids. And they also break down age kids by students in elementary school and students in high school. And those things drive what that percentage share is. So for your individual community, uh, you may have a good track record, you may have a, you know, a difficult track record, but there are things that are pushing that. Farmingdale, for example, has seen increases since they have such low enrollment, and just movement of a few kids pushes their tax share dramatically in one direction or the other. Uh, but most of the districts have seen their share of ups and downs. The green is what this budget represents. Um, so let me move to that slide. Of, uh, the increases and decreases associated with this budget. Um, again, I think it's important to look at it in context over the last few years um, and just to understand overall what's the, the district-wide change in the tax levy. And that, that'll give you a better feel. So for tax levy, and there is one note here, and I'll just make a quick comment, which is relatively insignificant, but just so that the tax rates tie in. There, there is a, um, a business personal property tax, and what that is is Verizon pays certain municipalities for equipment that they have within that municipality, but they'll pay tax on, um, and that comes directly off the tax rate. So in a very minor way, four of our communities are seeing uh, that their tax rates are mildly adjusted to the good when that happens. But I've removed that so it was a real apples to apples look at the two tax rates year over year. So this is the uh, tax rate, the tax impact for this year. I'll, I'll open it up to some questions uh, or comments that if anybody does have them. But what, what this budget does is it does provide the resources necessary to continue the momentum under our <coughs> within those appropriations of the market to 
block schedule and the expansion of our IEP program. Those other things that have uh, been um, identified as important items that we want to really target the resources that we have available to. It's also important to remember that this budget is linked, um, tied to the success of the referendum. Without a successful referendum, uh, we'll, we will not be able to do some of those things that will really improve the quality of the education our students receive, but we'll also crowd out uh, funding that will be necessary for some of the infrastructure stuff um, that is included in the referendum. So a word on that, this district's been very proactive about that. We set aside funds for that work that's been available. We also, also undertook a large uh, energy savings improvement plan, which is self-funding through energy savings, and that's without issuing debt. It's housed within the confines of the annual school budget. Referendum, once passed, and, and the bonds issued as a result of that, are not housed in the general fund. They're in the debt service fund. But the energy savings improvement plan that we did um, was better than $20 million worth of infrastructure work that we were able to accomplish under that at, you know, and, and funded through the energy savings that those, those improvements created. So that, that was a, a very successful program, but this reached a point where you know, we're out of options to fund some of these large ticket items. So our referendum is, is, is linked to uh, this budget and, and really budget and finally, the last thing to be very aware of is um, state aid and how that conversation progresses at the state level. Like I said, they were vulnerable here. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see how that shakes out. But it's something that we're very aware of. And we'll, we'll be able to uh, so that's an overview of the budget. And um, additional information on the supplemental handout. And as always, um, Actually, I didn't have a question, but more a comment. It's sort of tied into what Mrs. Cetera just asked about, that um, when I first read this document before the Finance Committee hearing um, 10 days ago, I did think the most impressive thing about it was actually um, in the, the beginning of the budget where you talked about state funding. I think you did do a phenomenal job of explaining how the state determines how much we get. And one of the things I actually highlighted here is what you had just mentioned about what the state considers um, how we are undertaxed. And it is good reading. The shame of it is, you know, 99.9% .9 of the population isn't going to read it, even though it does impact them so much. But I just wanted to compliment you that your state funding um, paragraphs are extremely well written and very easy to understand so I think you should be complimented about that does anybody else have any questions
there is no date. Uh, you know, there is no date certain. June thirtieth, I guess, is the state budget needs to be finalized by June thirtieth, and perhaps any change will be worked out by then. Um, I, I suppose that they could leave just the total funding for school districts intact in that state budget and have more time to determine how to allocate that pot of money. Um, whether or not the total pot of money is going to change, that also remains to be seen. And if, you, if you look at the state budget, roughly a third of the state budget is for schools. A third. It's a huge part of uh, their budget. Uh, and that includes direct aid to schools, as you see here. Uh, it also includes pension payments on behalf of schools and other associated costs, but their burden, their, their budget's burden of, of school aid and school costs is certainly a significant conversation. And just to, just to add one point, and you know, Sean lays this out very, very clearly, and we've been talking some of the proposals around ad addressing school funding uh, since Murphy's taken office and the sort of battle lines that have been drawn between State Senator Sweeney and, and, and the governor and some other factions, um, some, of, some of those proposed solutions really um, gloss over the complexity of the issue and, and they do it in a way that could be very dangerous to us and, and we recognize that. Uh, and, and not really um, acknowledging that at the end of the day, <laughs> they back into their numbers and retrofit the formula in some ways around, you know, whether it's however they determine the property value, equalized value, whatever. And uh, Sean's done a phenomenal job of um, helping me and helping the district testify, advocate with legislators and make clear points about um, you know districts like ourselves who are candidly um, delivering a, an incredibly high quality experience for our students and doing it for less of a cost than most of our neighbors uh, even k-8 neighbors right that don't have the high schools um, and making that point to uh, you know the powers that be is is an ongoing process that we continue to do and so um, to your point, Michael, about how Sean's clarity around how the, we arrive at those numbers, so we've used that to also educate legislators and other folks about the formula itself and some of the, the dangers in, in some of the proposed solutions. So Sean's been uh, very terrific in, in, in helping streamline that conversation. And um, I do want to point out one of the things that might get lost is that over the last two years there has been a reduction in teaching positions. Yeah, so this budget, um, it's, it's interesting, we didn't note it, but last budget, you know, the initial proposal was for seven positions. We ultimately reduced eight. Uh, this one, the initial proposal is, is, is for six. We, we feel though when, we, when we're done looking at the um, sorting out staffing in its final uh, phases, we, we think that it will be more than six as well. But um, when we discuss that, you know, we always want to err on the side of caution so that we don't overestimate it and then say, oh, well, we only, you know, so we, we try to um, uh, be conservative when we put the budget together and what we're looking at when we first do that. But it's more often than not more than what is indicated in the final tally. I guess there are no other questions. Does anybody from the public have any questions or comments for Mr. Boyce or anyone else up here? All right, then we are going to move on to E4 which is an adoption of the 2018-19 annual school budget. Anybody want to put forth a motion to adopt the 2018-19 annual budget? 
Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a second. Can you please call the roll, Mr. Boyce? Mrs. Cappiello? Yes. Mr. Carollo? Yes. Mrs. Fankhauser? Yes. Mrs. Lavin? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Mrs. Sutera? Yes. Mr. Bruno? Yes. Mr. Messinger? Yes. Now, I know nobody had any questions about the budget, but any public participation on any other issues for the Board of Education to consider? All right, then. Uh, any old business? Any new business? Does anybody want to put forth a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion. Second. Would you like to take the roll, Mr. Boyce? Mrs. Capiello? Yes. Mr. Carolla? Yes. Mrs. Fankhauser? Yes. Mrs. Lavin? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Mrs. Sutera? Yes. Mr. Bruno? Yes. Mr. Messer? Yes.